Professor Dr. Rakesh Lal from the National Drug Dependence Treatment Center has been keenly involved in the coordinating the efforts of various ministries and all involved in substance abuse control, including the Ministry of Health, Social Justice, and Ministry of Finances here in India. He's also played a key role in formulating the drug and alcohol abuse policies in India, as well as in neighboring countries. Uh, he's a member of the national counterpart parts of WHO and the informal scientific network of UNODC. Uh, he will talk, be talking about primary and secondary prevention today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairperson, for the kind words. Uh, at the very outset, I'd like to thank the organizers for having me here today. Uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, I'd like to say that it's, it's, I'm in a slightly awkward position because we, in the last session, we've had some very elegant talks by Mr. Hornberg, uh, Mr. Kapinos, and, uh, and then, of course, CC himself. Uh, it all gets compounded further by this very good lunch we had, and uh, and I'm sure you would rather be doing something else than listening to me. But uh, but here I am, and 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 that's what uh, that's what the situation is like. Okay, now we're talking about the international standards of prevention of drug use. Basically, we're talking about three things: the drug, the environment, and the person. Now, as far as the drug and the environment is concerned, there are we, we talk about various things like uh, like the availability and the pricing and uh, and I mean there are a lot of uh, policy issues involved, a lot of regulatory issues involved. So that's that's we are concentrating on the supply reduction, which is really not our job. I mean, I won't say it's not our job, but it's not our priority, and uh, that should be looked after the enforcement. Our emphasis basically is on the person. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you, not a lot of you, but a lot of us take alcohol, but everybody doesn't go and become dependent. Some people become dependent. Why? I mean, that is the question. Why do they become dependent? Uh, because they have some vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities could be their disadvantage in some way. It could be physical, it could be psychological, it could be emotional, it could be economic. I mean, there's so many things how they become vulnerable. So we have to make these people stronger. Uh, that is what our main focus is on. <clears throat> so the, I mean, I don't know if you're aware of the Sustainable Developmental Goal of 2030. They talk about very, very important things. I mean, like they talk about uh, health and nutrition, they talk about uh, clean air, they talk about uh, clean water, they talk about uh, judicial access to everybody. I mean, these are the kind of things, but even here, even here, you get a mention of prevention of drug use. I mean, they're talking about larger things, but prevention of drug abuse is important in health and nutrition. And when we talk about prevention, we talk about primary, secondary, and tertiary. Primary prevention is to stop, to, to prevent a person taking drug use. I mean, that, that might be a slightly grandiose. So at, we say at the best, what we can do is at least delay the onset of drug use is the primary. Secondary is the early recognition and treatment, provide facilities for that. And tertiary is, of course, dealing with the consequences, I mean, rehabilitating the person. Because a lot of persons have lost a lot of things using drugs, so they need to be rehabilitated. That is the most important thing. So when we, when we, when we speak about the, uh, we, we, when we talk about reducing vulnerability, we stop, start at the prenatal stage. When a child is born, he comes into the world, that is where he starts up the whole thing. So we're talking about, here we're talking about the mother. We're talking about the nutrition and health of the mother because if a mother is not healthy, uh, obviously the child is not going to be healthy. And if he's not healthy, then he'll be weak, he'll be disadvantaged in some way or the other. And then we talk about proper vaccinations. We talk about tobacco and alcohol used by the mother because tobacco and alcohol use can cause a lot of complications, iatrogenic complications in the child who may grow up, who may be born with some kind of a defect. And, and then of course, uh, of course, uh, we talk about pharmaceutical products. I mean, like, like pregnancy is a stressful period. I mean, like it's uh, psychologically, physically stressful. And uh, at the end of the day, the mother may be so tired who's carrying the child that she may, she may, she may feel justified that uh, I'm so tired. I mean, I can have, a, it's okay to have uh, some, some diazepam or some alprazolam. Here, it's a very strong no. It's not okay to have diazepam. You can have a good night's sleep with diazepam, yes, but you can cause a problem in the child which he'll be living with for the rest of his life. I mean, it is not, not, not okay to have. I mean, just because it's diazepam is licit and not illicit doesn't make any safer. Uh, 
I mean, that is something that we need to understand. And of course, of course, a normal delivery is so important because a child has to, if he doesn't cry after birth, he may grow up with a, some kind of intellectual deficit. And, and all these things I'm talking about, vulnerability. How do we reduce the vulnerability? Right from the pre-prenatal pre age. And then, of course, nutrition and health in infancy is so important. He has to grow up, vaccinations, and parenting skills. I mean, here, what parenting skills? A child, a child, a newborn child, uh, is only for himself. He's not bothered about anybody else. He can, he can urinate when he wants, he can get wet when he wants, he'll get hungry when he wants, and, uh, and it is quite troublesome for the mother. But the thing is that she can, she, can, she can choose not to attend to the child, but then the child is going to be uncomfortable. He's going to grow up insecure. Insecurity is going to cause a problem. If he's not secure, if he's secure, if the mother is looking after him, he feels secure, he feels confident. But if he's insecure, uh, right from the beginning, and this could be a potential reason, a seed which might lead him to drug abuse again because he's insecure. And, and, and the other thing we're talking about is, again, you see, nutrition and health is everywhere. That's so important. We're talking about vaccination, we're talking about mental health. You know, here, when the child is in the middle childhood, he may, I'm not saying he will, he may have some kind of attention deficit disorder, he may have some kind of a conduct disorder, so he's troublesome. And if he's troublesome, one, one parenting skill would be to deal with it in a mature way. One will be to just beat him into submission. If he's been naughty, you beat him into submission. Now that is in effect pushing him away. I mean like he's, you're pushing him away to other people where he's more comfortable with and whom he's going to deal with is something which is not in our hand. I mean he may get into the right company, he may get into the wrong company. Uh, one, one very protective mechanism is enrollment in school. Now, it's, it's okay. I mean, it's okay when you're talking about a, a, a resource-risk country that everybody's going to be in school, but I'm talking about India, I'm talking about a lot of developing countries. This is not always a problem. Uh, India has got a good system, like there are private schools which are very expensive, but then there are government schools where, where it is free. They give you free, free uh, books, they give you free uniform, they give you even free lunch. I mean, they're saying that even if a child just comes to the free lunch, he spends his whole day in school, that is also protective. He may or may not learn anything, but he's spending the whole day in school, which is what we want. He may be coming only for a lunch, that's quite, quite okay. Uh, it could be a dysfunctional family, which will again cause a stress to the child, which we need to look after, and, and discipline. Discipline is important, but please be consistent. It's not that sometimes something is okay, sometimes something is not okay. I mean, that is not okay. I mean, be, have discipline, yes, but be consistent with the discipline. And of course, one has to be a role model. It's not that a father is going to be drinking alcohol the day and tell the child, no, 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 alcohol drinking is bad. Or he does X, Y, Z and so, no, that's bad. He's, you're, you're, you're the role model for your child. I mean, he's going to observe you and learn, not by what you're going to tell him. That's not what he's going to learn. Adolescence is again uh, nutrition and health. He's at the crossroad where he's going to get into adulthood. Adulthood means positive and negatives. So we have to make sure that he gets into the positive aspects of adulthood. And here the parenting skills are important. If he does something wrong, you, you yell at him and uh, he's not going to be a friend. He's never going to confide in you again. He's going to go to other places, which is not good. He should be a friend. He should be able to confide in you so that you can lead him in the right path. And of course here the teachers are so important because what a teacher does is acceptable. The teacher may be doing the right thing, hopefully, if he does the wrong thing, that is also acceptable. And then there are certain misconceptions, like take for alcohol, or take for, take, take uh, tobacco, for example, that I have become an adult, so I can smoke. Or uh, I'm, 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 I'm a show, I'm looking handsome, the girls are attracted to me. I mean, these are the kind of conceptions people have where they start tobacco. So the message we give for taking tobacco is this. I mean, this is something we've got to understand, that you are not handsome, you are not attractive, you, Females are not um, falling hello heels, heels for you. This is what is going to happen. So this is the kind of message that we need to give him. Then of course, uh, then of course, as he grows up, we talk about workplace intervention. Workplace has got its own policies, where they can uh, they they need to have some policies where uh, where where drug use is not encouraged. You should have an early recognition. There should be a system in the workplace where there'll be early recognition and and kind of management. And, and of course, uh, no easy availability of alcohol, at least in the workplace. And of course, uh, one has to make a policy that is the treatment, go, is, the, is, the, is exposure to any drug going to be a disciplinary action or you're going to be helping him as an illness. 
If it's a disciplinary, what's going to happen is that he's going to hide the thing. It's not that he's going to not take a drug because he's scared. He's going to hide the drug and he'll still maybe not come in time or maybe, maybe have other problems, or maybe uh, have a lot of absenteeism, so many other things. <clears throat> then we talk about national policies. I mean, national policies are something that, that one is licit and illicit, the other is that availability. And take for licit substances like alcohol and tobacco, you have hours of sale, you have the age limit of sale, you have the location of outlets, I mean, there's so many policies for everything. So a country should, should, should have a policy. Policy is not a law, but it's something that which has the guidelines and that is so important that every country needs to have a proper national policy. And then of course when you talk about the secondary prevention, we're talking about, uh, we're talking about when a person has started. Here we're trying that he does not start. When he started drug use, then, then what do we do about it? And this is something that I love to show, that make treatment services available. That's the first thing. Make it affordable. I mean, just because, just because you have uh, treatment services available uh, and it's not affordable, nobody's going to access it. And uh, the, the people are not coming to you for various, you have, you have so many centers available, people are not coming. One is the stigma that, uh, that uh, what will people think about it? And one is the belief that, no, oh, once a drug addict, always a drug addict. There's no, no cure for it. And the third is that, oh, I can't afford it. It's so expensive. So make it affordable. Make it accessible. Because one thing about the drug use is that it's not a, it's not a treatment like flu for one week medicines. I mean, detoxification, fine. You do it in 10 to 15 days. But to prevent him, you need a long-term treatment for months and years, weeks, months, years. So if he has to travel 500 kilometers, obviously it's not possible to come. I mean, you don't expect him to come. So it has to be accessible and it has to be acceptable. Something that you don't lock him up in a room and beat him up and tell him to leave the drug. I mean, then the message is going to go all around that this is no good. You need, you need some kind of evidence-based treatment. And, and I can't resist adding to these four A's is another A, the attitude. The attitude we all have that once a drug addict, always a drug addict. And drug addicts is they, them. And, and I mean, that kind of a thing. I mean, like you keep them away, don't get married to the children, don't get so many things. I mean, that attitude is that because we have that kind of a moral attitude. It's a bad habit, it's a moral attitude. We need to change that this is an illness, it's a disease. It's a, we've got to treat it like any other disease, any chronic illness. That is something that we need to understand. And then, of course, having done that, having made available, accessible, affordable, make it aware. People should be know that you've got all the facilities, it's affordable, it's acceptable, it's, it's available, everything. Make people aware of the thing. I mean, otherwise, otherwise, if people are not aware, they're not going to access the whole, whole thing at all. And, and then, of course, once we get this thing, then, then have to have a proper treatment surface. First thing, you need the epidemiology. What are the drugs which are being taken? Because you need to have a treatment service accordingly. I, I open a very good center in maybe, maybe Kochi, uh, which deals with cocaine addicts. And maybe I get one patient a month. What good is it? And what, what service am I doing? I've got all the facilities, but I've not done my research. I've not seen that there are hardly any cocaine addiction here. So I need to focus on alcohol or maybe cannabis or something. Not, not open up a center because it's more glamorous or something of that kind. And so open up a center for cocaine, which is useless. It's a waste of money. We have to see which are the substances being used. Who is the substance user? Because we have to focus there. The substance user, one is the adult. Then we are talking about various marginal groups. The marginalized population, like it could be the younger or the older. The marginalized people are the ones who do not, who are taking drugs, but who are not accessing things. If it's a young child or an old person, old person nobody really bothers about. I mean, even if he's taking drug, he's not productive. So he's just lying in, the, in, in one side of the room and, and he's quiet and he's not bothering. But he's causing a lot of health problems and all. That's a different thing. But the problem is that he's not earning. So it doesn't really matter if he's taking drugs. If he's not working, it doesn't really matter. So, and then, of course, is the question of women. Women are 50% of the population, but sometimes they are not equally important. At least in developing countries, they're not equally important because once again, their income earning capacity is not so much. So, so they're not, not so important. And although they are 50% of the population, then of course, ethnicity, the, the kind of social groups, the person with comorbidities, who've got psychological comorbidities or something, they, are, they cannot enforce, they do not want 
they do not want treatment, they do not demand treatment, so they are again sidelined. You got to go out and want treatment to get treatment. Then of course there are the homeless workers, sex workers, prisons, and, 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 and these kind of things. And then of course, uh, uh, then of course, okay, I'll, I'll just be very brief. Then of course we have to find out, is it a burden? Why are we bothering to treat these guys? I mean, is it a burden in the society? We have to access if it's a burden or not. And then of course, what my earlier speakers, Mr. Hornberg and I will be speaking, is there a treatment gap? But there, the fact is that there is a big treatment gap at least only about 5 to 10 percent of people who need treatment are taking treatment. And of course, then we have to make treatment options available, evidence-based intervention, minimum standards of care, and human rights. I mean, he, just because they're drug addicts, he does not lose human rights. Even a prisoner has got human rights. That's something we can understand. Patient dignity is so important. The UN talks about it, WHO talks about it, everybody talks about human this thing, and capacity building. We sitting out here cannot manage. We have to have capacity building, the whole, everybody has to be, a larger group has to be involved in the management of drug use. Just a small specialist group is not good enough. And with these things, these little words, I, I come to an end of my talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, the international standards of prevention stretch from early childhood into adulthood. And I think you summarized that quite well. Uh, and including the need to address the stigma around people who have used drugs and are in addiction, because that is of very much importance in order to um, lead into long-term recovery. So thank you for that. Uh, so our next speaker, whom I will introduce, is Mr. Mohammad Ridwan bin Samad from Sana, Singapore. Please, thank you. As a senior executive of Sana, Mohammad Ridwan's role involves conducting preventive drug education programs, which is targeted at youth, as well as the general population. He's also part of the team that runs projects that assist families of incarcerated persons, which have assisted thousands of families over the past decade. So, thank you for being here today. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, I don't think that's good enough. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much. So, I'm here all the way from Singapore. My name is Ridwan, once again, and I'm with the Singapore Anti-Narcotics Association. And what I'm going to talk about today is, of course, international standards of prevention, but I'm going to do it through the lens of uh, a civil society member in Singapore. And how I'm going to structure this presentation is briefly mention the international standards on drug use prevention. And then what I'm doing is I am highlighting two areas of this document, the uh, international standards and seeing how we've applied, or rather we've translated those words into actions in Singapore. If you've read the document, how many of you here have read the document? Can I say a show of hands? 84 pages long. How many of you here have not read the document? Can I see a show of hands? How many of you here, no matter what I ask, you never put up your hand? <laughs> Alright, so maybe they're a bit shy and all that, but as long as you're not sleeping, that's fine. Right, so... We'll look at these two areas and then I'll round off my presentation by highlighting some of the challenges and opportunities that we see in Singapore through our work uh, applying some of these uh, standards. Now, as what Regina mentioned, the uh, International Standards of Drug Use Prevention contains major components on, and features of an effective drug, national drug prevention system. So within that document itself, uh, there are various recommendations on various aspects of society where you can adopt and apply some of these evidence-based practices within our own communities. And jointly developed by the UN, ODC and WHO, so uh, we are assured that when we look at such a document, it's tested, there's uh, evidence that proves that these approaches have worked somewhere, and that if we apply them in our own context, there's a good chance that we can see some level of success. Okay, right, so the two areas that, one of the two areas that I have identified to present to all of you is firstly, early adolescent interventions. Basically, what we are looking at is how do we ensure young people, children to their pre-teens, stay away from drugs in the first place, meaning they don't get involved at all. And the recommendations from that document, the international standards, they talk about a focus on fostering substance and peer refusal abilities, as well as a platform for us to discuss social norms, attitudes and positive and negative expectations associated with substance abuse, as well as including the consequences that come with substance abuse. So with this in mind, and uh, as I look at what SANA does and what our fellow uh, civil society members do, 
The things that we do include preventive drug education talks and workshops. So my job is to go around schools and basically tell kids not to take drugs. And not just that, I tell them about what drugs are about, the current situation in Singapore, and actually the consequences that come with drug consumption. So that, in essence, they are able to make informed decisions of their, whatever choice that they make when it comes to drug abuse. Part of our sharing also includes involving former drug addicts, people who have been arrested, who have gone through treatment, who have gone through the prison system. When they come out, they want to give back to society. They realize that uh, society have, has done a lot to change them and they want to give back to society. We give them that platform to engage these young people uh, through our workshops so that they share their experiences, they share their errors so that our young people are aware of what comes next should they make should they be presented, ever be presented with the uh, choice, uh, people come up to them and offer them drugs, what happens if they choose the wrong path? And later on, during our workshops and talks, what we do is we don't just educate young people, the people within the group or people within that room. We don't just stop there because we realize I'm only one person. SANA is only one organization. We have a lot of people in our society. How can we reach out? to all of them in different pockets of society. So what we do is we change these youth participants of our workshops, we make them into youth ambassadors. So what happens after they've gone through the first part of our workshop that covers drug information and consequences, we help them develop project ideas such that they are able to implement uh, ground-up projects in their own schools and in their own communities. So we use processes like design thinking to help them ideate innovative and creative projects to address this particular issue. And one thing that we do, and I think we've done very well, is we always ask the, the students or the youth that we've engaged through our programs, we ask them whether or not they actually understand what we're talking about and whether or not they find the course content uh, meaningful. So as you can see over here in our data, uh, we find that the mo majority of our participants actually benefit from our workshops and they have gained a better understanding of the issues pertaining to drug abuse. Besides what we do at SANA, we go around to schools and the community to deliver workshops and talks. Uh, our community partners, they run other types of uh, community engagement events. One of the key projects that uh, one of our partners have run is uh, the formulation of this Drug Buster Academy. So what this is, this is not a tour bus, we're not taking a tour bus to go anywhere for tourism. This bus, inside it, there are actually interactive stations where they uh, convey information about the dangers of drug abuse, uh, information about uh, the consequences of abusing drugs through all these interactive platforms. Right? So this bus, the benefit of it is that it's able to travel all over Singapore, and uh, upon request, come to our location so that young people are given an added dimension of learning about drugs. Uh, other than that, we also organize various events to keep young people occupied. Because if you leave them alone, if they are missing, if you leave them alone and the chances of them being misinformed by their peers who might not know any better will be much higher. So what we do is we have events such as dance works where young people come together, they take part in this dance, dance contest and through that event, they are also uh, made known of information pertaining to drug abuse and in that way, we also ensure that they are engaged and they stay away from unsavory activities that might lead them to drug abuse. Some of the other uh, recommendations include mentoring because mentoring in itself and it's from our experience as well, it is linked to reduced rates of substance abuse and also violence. So what we do is we match young people from marginalised communities, marginalised circumstances with adults who are able to commit their time, their resources to mentor these young people to ensure that they stay away from drugs. And we've seen a lot of success and most mentoring programmes in Singapore are run by NGOs such as SANA and also social enterprises, meaning businesses with a social focus. Now, when we talk about prevention, it's very easy for us to say, yes, uh, we need to ensure young people don't get started in, on drugs in the first place. And it's perhaps even more interesting to work with young people. And you, the youth narrative has always been put out there. You know, we should work with young people, get them, stop them from taking on drugs in the first place. But what about the ones who are no longer that young? What about the adults who have already been involved in drugs in the first place or at risk of being involved in drugs? What do we do for them? Because they are also part of our society. We might stop the young, but what about those who are already involved or are at risk of being involved? What can we do? 
So, one of the recommendations from the standards include media campaigns because essentially it is the most effective way of gaining high visibility and reaching out to a large number of people. I'm sure most people here would have their mobile phones at least, so getting to people, even in this room, it's as easy as a click on the computer. So what SANA has been doing over the past year is that we've capitalised on social media to reach out to as many people as possible within the society. So we use media personalities, so famous people or known people within our community to talk about the issues and ensure that there's a spotlight on those issues so that young people and those not so young are appraised of the uh, situation, drug situation in Singapore and the consequences that come with it. Besides our personalities, we also engage athletes, you know, people who have done a lot for the country, people who have established themselves as uh, people who are community champions. What we do is we engage them to also talk about this issue so that, again, we reach out to as many segments of society as possible. Those who are more inclined to follow media personalities, we have them covered. Those who are involved, more inclined to follow the athletes, they are also covered. So we try our best to reach out to as many people in different segments of, of society as possible. One of the things that we do at SANA as well, taking advantage of the fact that a lot of people in Singapore have mobile phones, is the launch of our Talk to SANA platform. What this is, is an online resource portal where it hosts information about drugs, drug abuse and the drug situation in Singapore. Not only that, it also hosts an online chat platform. So for example, a young person who might not be uh, very keen to see someone face to face, to go up to a counsellor or to go up to their parents or to go up to their teachers to talk about this drug related issues. What they do is they can log on online to our chat platform and talk to a counsellor from SANA so that our counsellors can give good advice rather than having them turn to their friends or their acquaintances who might not know any better or might even give them bad advice. So we've seen a lot of um, success in this platform. We average 160 new views per month, and I'm sure in the months to come, we, we can have better engagement to the community through this platform. Now, SANA, as I mentioned, SANA ourselves, we can't possibly reach out to the entire Singapore population, so we also rely on communities within Singapore to help us out in our efforts. And because at the community level, when we mobilise different partners within the community, we are able to multiply the impact that we have. One of the key initiatives that we have been championing over the past 10 years is known as the Yellow Ribbon Community Project. The Yellow Ribbon in Singapore signifies uh, acceptance for ex-offenders, which includes drug offen uh, ex-drug offenders into our society. So the key thrust of this project is to reach out to families of incarcerated persons. What we find is that if we reach out to families, we ensure that they are stable, they are able to form a good support network for ex-drug offenders who have come out from prisons. This is so that we are able to reduce recidivism in our society. So, how do we help these families? We identify vulnerable children within those families so that we can give bespoke support. We also provide pro-social support to these families whereby we get the community volunteers themselves to check in on these families, not just once, not just twice, but over the period of the of the incarceration of their family member so that we are able to ensure they are okay and they are prepared to receive the family member once they leave prisons. And also to rekindle family bonds between the inmates and their families. There are families who may want to distance themselves from their family member who's imprisoned. There are family members who might not want to even get in touch with them after they are released. So what we do at SANA with the community volunteers is we engage the family, we try to encourage them to get in touch with the inmate, visit them in prisons, so that they are able to keep that connection as a family unit. We also provide uh, community social assistance and support, so be it in the form of financial assistance or other forms of uh, support that the family may need through this trying time. And ultimately, this facilitates the process for inmates to reintegrate with their family and society with a solid support network, which is the family and also other community stakeholders we hope that the inmate, once they are released, they, they, they will stay away from the path of drug consumption and on the path of recovery and reintegration. All right, my time is almost up. Um, 
So uh, since 2010, 9,000 inmates opted for the YRCP and we have trained more than 900 volunteers. What this translates to is, if you think about one inmate per family, we've helped more than 9,000 families over the past decade. And just to quickly round off, uh, trends and challenges, we see that young people today are more keen on uh, believing what's shown on social media and also uh, streaming media platforms such as Netflix. Um, these shows typically trivialize the effects and harm of drug abuse. A lot of them have a different perspective of uh, cannabis consumption because of some of these shows. Not only that, because the internet is so pervasive, young people today are able to access drugs such as MPS, new psychoactive substances, through the internet and have them delivered to their homes. This has happened, this could happen and might even be an even bigger problem in the future. So how can we solve this? So in conclusion, evidence-based prevention strategies highlighted in the uh, international standards for prevention have been largely effective in Singapore from our experience. Of course, there are certain areas that we need more work on and we do hope that with everyone's collective experience, everyone's collective expertise, we are able to stymie the growth of drug abusers and drug use in Singapore. With that, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the standards state that the effective prevention contributes significantly to the pos positive engagement of children, youth, adults, their schools, families, workplace and the community and I think that you've shown how to put those uh, standards into practice in a very good way. So thank you for that. I think we have a lot to learn from Sana. Our uh, last but not least, our final speaker, Mr. Shakya who is the Secretary General of Healthy Lanka in Sri Lanka, uh, began his career as attorney at, attorney at law and practiced law in the Supreme Court of Sri Lanka. He then went on to pursue uh, formal education in psychology and human resource management before starting his work with ADIC, which is the Alcohol and Drug Information Center, Sri Lanka. So thank you for being here today. Uh, well, uh, morning session. Biggest problem here in India is alcohol and then uh, some narco some other opiates as well as uh, opiates as well as uh, cannabis. Yes, uh, my topic is challenging drug-related positive outcome expectancies and challenging masculinities and femininities as an effective drug prevention strategy. Right. Uh, well. If someone take alcohol or heroin or cannabis, how does he feel, right? In head, it's a little pain in head, headache, heavy headedness, rotating feeling that is mostly drowsiness, and then in the body, decline in energy and liveliness, as well as, and you see the unbalance, as well as itchiness, especially with heroin, and they become very slow. Mouth, bitter, dry mouth, Stomach, nauseous, and vomiting. Do you label these effects pleasurable? Can you say that is rush, that is bus, that is uh, pleasure? No. This is, all these are unpleasant. Then, why do people use drugs? Right. Uh, we are going to uh, see that next. Okay, heroin, alcohol, or other drugs like cannabis, the real experience of that is unpleasant even at optimum level. And you see that it is boring and uninteresting, as well as uh, using it is a little silly and stupid. Right? This is the reality. This is the real pharmacological effect, real chemical effect of those substances. But why do people use drugs then? Because they perceive it pleasurable and then very rewarding, as well as positive and beneficial. That is the reason why they are using drugs. So we have to determine when doing prevention or planning any prevention strategy, how this uh, uninteresting and boring alcohol or other drug become pleasurable and rewarding and positive and beneficial. Well, I tried to present five ways of becoming it pleasurable. One is the pleasure given by others. After using heroin, I can do anything and next day I am excused Hey, he is a drug user. I can go and blackguard the next door neighbor uh, and she will excuse me, oh, he was under the influence of alcohol. So even it gives me headache, I can blackguard the next door neighbor. So it is beneficial. That benefit is given 
by us not it is not the pharmacological or chemical effect of that substance and then symbol of pleasure people use drugs when they are relaxed when they are happy elated and that kind of uh, circumstances that they are using drugs when they are happy they use drugs when they are happy with they use drugs then that drug acquires kind of a, a, a happy symbol symbol of happiness through condition it may be classical condition it may be operant conditioning or social learning so that is also not the chemical property of that substance but we attribute pleasure to that drug and thirdly we can say expectancies that is the main all these are expectancies if you ask why you are using drugs i, I will explain that they will say many reasons for that and fourthly i like to take up this masculinity and the power so that is why uh, it is important to challenge masculinity and femininity for example right a boy and a girl in a house right they all exposed the boy and the girl both exposed to uh, me, uh, propaganda uh, tele teledramas but after some time boy goes and start drug use but the girl remain uh, the same so why what is the reason for that so that also area that we have to look into and other thing is removing of withdrawal discomfort most of these withdrawal uh, discomforts from the drugs are mind made just like for compulsive gambling you don't say compulsive gambler when he has sick or withdrawal discomfort it is it is because of the chemical effect we know it is psychological effect just as that the majority of the uh, withdrawal discomforts are mind made and it can be cured also through the mind well others given pleasure there are two ways of doing it that that is the sanction of breaking rules and thirdly the pardon for secondly the pardon for bad performance as i said uh, you, uh, you you are sanctioned to break rules after using drugs or heroin or any other alcohol or any other drugs second thing you can just perform anything even it is bad people blame the drug and not 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 to that person so so they use it as a alibi for bad performances but all that is the pleasure given by others so we make it pleasurable for him and alcohol and other drug induced misbehavior is pardoned or we did tolerant permissiveness by many societies and we know the victims also continue to excuse the behavior in belief that they were done unintentionally right so people blame the drug not the behavior and finally uh, even with alcohol you know after what they say i had a little too much i was under the influence then we excuse all those behaviors so it is not the chemical effect but the pharmacological effect of that substance then uh, if you take the heroin use and we use it as a self handicapping mechanism self handicapping to protect your uh, person pers personality like if i ask someone to sing please sing a nice song she will start singing saying <clears throat> today my throat is also a little bit uh, bad uh, so that is a self handicapping thing right so if he sings well oh we think oh he, uh, if if the throat was good how she would have sung and if she goes flat we know it's not her but the bad throat likewise that's a self handicapping likewise we allow people to behave the way and ultimately all the blame come to alcohol and the uh, drugs and he is also he is a good person so likewise the self self handicapping is one area uh, how it connect to alcohol and heroin use a heroin user accused of theft excuse on the ground that the act was the result of desperation created by the heroin he is able to escape blame having heroin as an excuse that is one way so, so so it is not him but it's heroin right heroin user is generally excused from seeking employment if i if i don't do a job my wife will ask hey you are aren't to doing a job my my children will ask hey you are not doing a job but heroin user he can happily be at home and wife is also asking why don't you go and do a job probably wife will say hey you stay home i will do some work and try to support you and like that so he is excused from doing job job or whatever as other members of their household tends to view the behavior of the heroin user sympathetically they are invariably uh, released him from other uh, things so the heroin user can 
very night very late he can sleep till 10 o'clock right can we come home every day very late no they will ask but the heroine also can come see he enjoys all that freedom so that is a pleasure given by the others right okay the second thing i would like to go it is the symbol of pleasure symbol of pleasure means uh, right uh, the, the, the attribution that you give, give to them. so ultimately the alcohol or the drug uh, becomes the symbol of happiness symbol of uh, uh, adulthood symbol of rebelliousness symbol of relaxation symbol of masculinity as well as uh, uh, symbol of non feminine why i say that Be because i have to i have to a little bit uh, elaborate on that matter as well right uh, then i like to talk about li drug expectancies what are the, what are the drug expectancies drug expectancies are generally understood as beliefs concerned uh, drugs that commonly exist in society they are cognitive effective and behavioral outcomes that an individual Ex expects right uh, what are the common uh, expectancies why if i ask a drug user if i ask a heroin user or a alcohol user why do you use alcohol you know the harm harmful side of it then why do you do they come with various things i drink to forget problems to uh, uh, forget unpleasant experience then expectancy challenge modality is just telling him it won't help you to forget problems ultimately your problems are aggravated and new problems are arise so that understanding will come eventually uh, with this expectancy challenge model and so i drink to ease tiredness but what happens ultimately uh, it's a poison and you have to get rid of that poison and the metabolic rate in the body goes up and you and at, at at the end of the day that you your tiredness increases so it won't help us to relax or tired to ease tiredness but it will increase your tiredness that reality will be understood with this uh, expectancy challenge uh, process then happy and elated we discuss it that uh, it is unpleasant and boring so uh, to to have that to break the connection between the happiness and drug is a main component in this expectancy challenge model increase sometimes people drink drink say to increase their self confidence to speak in the stage sometimes they have to use drugs or uh, alcohol but actually what happened his depend he he becomes a dependent so his self confidence comes down relax and tense then the chemical dependency and psychological dependency also i i, I little bit mentioned about it there are several things sometimes people use drugs to sleep well but they they never get the rem, get to the, into the rem stage they never get to the deep sleep and sometimes they say hey i drink because i want to hurt my wife right he gives lot of trouble but ultimately with this acceptance channel model he realized that actually i am hurting myself not i am hurting any other to eat well actually drugs reduce appetite then uh, 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 and then sexual desire actually decreases sexual desire likewise this expectancy challenge model we are working on then i would like to uh, talk about the uh, masculinity thing because uh, to show that you are a man you have to you have to uh, use drugs now we say uh, the, this masculinity and femininity that we say that uh, for example uh, careful women are careful but to be a man that you have to show that you are not careful you you are risk taking to risk to take risk that you have to take drugs we may not very decent sometimes you have to show that you are not decent because if you are do decent you are a woman and and then you have to show that you are sometimes indecent then how can i show that i am indecent having some alcohol having some drugs is a way to show that i am indecent therefore actually when we uh, when we nurture boys we are actually uh, uh, may, may motivate them to use drugs because of this masculinity and femininity therefore challenging this masculinity and femininity is an integral part in alcohol and drug prevention thank you